Thank you, everyone. My name is Chris Cornell. And I am here tonight to induct an amazing band, and they also happen to be my hometown heroes, a band called Heart. The heart of that band comes from the singular synergy in the sisterhood of Ann and Nancy Wilson. They have more than earned this moment to at long last stand with all the other rock gods and take their rightful place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Come on up. Being from a military family, our mom raised us pretty much as a dad and a mom. Our mother never, you know, gave us cause to think that, that we had to take a back seat. She gave us all kinds of permission yeah. to be, you know, our own people and not be compartmentalized as women. Gave us music and, you know, gave us, I think, our power and permission to rock. <laughs> <laughs> You would hear on the FM radio that there's this new Beatles album coming out called Abbey Road and you better go get it. The first day yeah. that the album came out, you'd be there being fans of music, being fans of Elton John, going to the show, going to see Led Zeppelin play live and having your life altered by seeing that stuff in person. Yeah. Trying to fly into that, you know, like you're the moth flying into that particular flame. As teenagers, we attempted to figure out how to write songs that sounded like songs we liked. We tried to write like a, you know, song like Bob Dylan, like a protest song. And then we tried to write another song that was more like the Beatles with a sense of humor. And all of these things were kind of like trying on different suits, you know, like outfits, and trying to figure out who we were gonna be as writers. Well, making our first record um, up in Vancouver, BC, it was called Dreamboat Annie, and at that time we were a bar band just listening to the radio, listening to what was big on the radio, and it, it was ABBA and Deep Purple and Queen and, and Led Zeppelin, and we knew nothing about the studio, about the recording process or songwriting or song choosing or anything like that. We worked with a producer, Mike Flicker, who was the first one to really reach in and understand what was us, and he helped us pull it out. When you finish recording an album, writing all the songs, going through the whole recording process, there's this period of maybe, I don't know, a few weeks or months before it gets released where you feel really good about it, you know, and you listen to it constantly, you loop it, you just love it, you lay it on the floor and roll around on it because you <laughs> love it so much, and no one has yet told you that it sucked or that <laughs> it was yet. good. No one has had an opinion, no one's waited. And that's a real period of grace, I mean. It's sort of like when you have a child who has not yet gone to kindergarten, you know, and they're safe at home, and then, you know, the first day of school, you're like, no! Where did you learn that word? <laughs> After Dreamboat Annie was released, there was a real loud silence. I don't think anyone knew where to pigeonhole us. At that time, on the radio, they could only play one female act per hour. And we already had Joan Baez. We already had <laughs> Janis and, Joplin and or, or Ava. So it was, it was silent at first. And then as we worked it and we you know, went out and went to radio stations and said, hi, we're Anna Nancy Wilson. Here's our record, play it they started to slowly pick it up.
We had just been fired from a club gig out in Alberta for acting up in the wrong way. And <laughs> it was like a movie moment. It was the the opener for Rod Stewart. Couldn't make it, so they said, hey, you want to go out and fill in? <laughs> and so we got ourselves out there on a train, and we walked on stage to a house full of lit matches. Do they think we're ABBA? Do they think we're somebody <laughs> else? You know, could, could this be for us? You sort of look behind you. Yeah. Uh, we can remember that moment because it was the first one, you know, and it was so out there. We didn't understand why they were reacting to us in that way. And then it dawned on us like, oh, <laughs> they must know this. Because they were playing the record in Montreal on this French Canadian station, it was a big surprise. The moment that I think we realized that our first album was going to be big was way into it. it. It was when it was about to go gold, which is half a million mm -hmm. copies. And someone came up to us <laughs> backstage and went, guess what, your record's about to go gold. And we had been working so hard and traveling and playing, we hadn't been really paying attention. We were with a little indie label, Mushroom Records, so they didn't really keep us in touch. No fax yet, no cell phones, no email. So it was quite possible to not be aware of what your record was doing. As writers, we always were, were trying to get a world view that might, might not become dated. Like, for instance, Crazy on You could have been written, you know, last year. It's talking about the world situation and the stress of life in this world as a human being, you know, and how, you know, love is the oversimplified but only answer. <laughs> and uh, Barracuda was written in, in anger. That's burning just as hot, you know, today as it was then. In the actual moment of recording our first yeah. album, I don't think we had any clue that it was gonna still be being played in 2015, yeah. especially by us, you know? Yeah. But on the radio, in people's homes, in that it would still be with people's lives. So many really young people who, like, say maybe they <laughs> fall in love and they don't think about, hey, we're, we're still gonna be together in 60 years. They just think, we're gonna get to the altar. And that's, that's how we were thinking about making a record, about writing songs. Yeah. Listen, we lost 18 games in a row. And every game before the game, I had to make our team believe that we were going to win that game.